نحمده ونصلي على رسوله الكريم اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقهوا قولي واجعل لي وزيرا من اهلي اللهم فكهنا في الدين اللهم اني اسالك حبك وحب من يحبك وعمل الذي يبلغني حبك اللهم الهمنا رشدا وعزنا من شرور انفسنا اللهم ارنا الحق حقا وارزقنا اتباعه اللهم ارنا الباطل باطلا وارزقنا اجتنابه امين ثم امين سورة الاعراف The surah was revealed in Mecca and it has 206 verses and 24 stanzas and is the seventh by the order of revelation. The period of revelation is the same like surah al-an'am and the basic topics and the summary of the chapter is that Allah has clearly explained and related that all those who will believe and then following their belief they will obey the teachings of quran and hadith they will be the ones who will be successful here and hereafter and they will be rewarded and on the contrary all those who fail to do this that is do what to believe and to obey the commandments of quran and hadith all those who will fail to do this allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will punish them and they will receive the torments of hell fire Now according to a manner of uh, the teachings of Quran Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when explains something or when narrates a basic concept or an order or a commandment or a summary Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala supports it with logical proofs and these logical proofs Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provides to the reciter of the Quran through uh, examples of um, our cells that is from our body and from our lives and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala quotes and gives examples of all around us of the creations of the universe and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala quotes examples from the past that is uh, the thing which Allah is trying to explain or rub in Allah quotes that there were people of the past nation who accepted and they were blessed and or who uh, failed to accept and they were punished and then allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the alimul ghaib allah he mentions the punishments in the future so we will come across the same uh, style of uh, the explanation of the quran in this surah araf where allah will be explaining that those who obey will be rewarded and those who disobey will be punished and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be giving us all these four times uh, four types of explanations and narrations to help us understand comprehend and relate to the basic summary of surah al araf بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الف لام ميم صاد كتاب انزل اليك فلا يقوم في صدرك حرج منه لتنذر به وذكرى للمؤمنين اتبعوا اتبعوا ما انزل اليكم من ربكم ولا تتبعوا من دونه اولياء قليلا ما تذكرون الف لام ميم صاد this is a book revealed to you muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam so let there not be in your breast any distress therefrom that you may warn thereby and as a reminder to the believers so right in the beginning of the chapter allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given an introduction uh, introduction to his book his prophet the purpose of its revelation and the behavior which he desires with his book and how comprehensively how comprehensively in one verse as allah subhanahu wa taala explains such an extensive subject 
Now, the purpose of the revolution of Quran has been explained as what? Zikra lil alameen, a reminder for the whole world. And to take as a reminder, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is explaining that one needs to connect with it open-mindedly, with an open heart. So Allah has told Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what? Fala yaqum fi sadrika harajun. And Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has been addressed and uh, he has been told that while connecting to this book, we need to connect with it with an open mind and with an open heart. Open mind and heart while doing what? While reading or reciting it, understanding or believing in it. We should be open-minded. And then we should be open-minded regarding adopting it in our lives, implementing, teaching, preaching, and protecting of all the commandments and laws of Quran. We need to be open-minded and open heart. We, have need, we need to have open heart in all relations. In all these matters, one should be open-minded. This is how we will, we will, all students of Quran, we need to relate with the teachings of Quran. As Allah says in Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, help us all, guide us all, that without any tightness or constraints regarding the teachings of Quran, we understand it, we comprehend it, we believe it, we remember it, and we adopt and implement in our lives. And then without any narrow-mindedness or without any constraints, we teach it, we preach it, and we implement, try and work to struggle to implement it in our society and in our state. Verse number three, follow, O mankind, what has been revealed to you from your Lord, and do not follow other than him any allies. Little do you remember. And how many cities we destroyed and our punishment came to them at night or while they were sleeping at noon. So from here, verse number four to verse number seven, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to explain the main message of the surah will relate some events from the cities of the past. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's punishment came to them, what did they do? And their declaration when our punishment came to them was only that they said, indeed, we were the wrongdoers. Then we will surely question those to whom a message was sent, and we will surely question the messengers. Then we will surely relate their deeds to them with knowledge, and we were not at all absent. And the weighing of the deeds that day will be the truth. So those whose scales are heavy, with scales, the scales of the righteous deeds, it is they who will be successful. And those whose scales are light, they are the ones who will lose themselves for what injustice they were doing towards our verses. So in these verses, number eight and nine, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is explaining what the, regarding the summary of Surah Araf, what will happen in the future on the Day of Judgment. And we have certainly established you upon the earth and made for you therein ways of livelihood. Little are you grateful. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here is uh, narrating generally what is prevalent. The prevalent state of affairs that despite the revolution of the divine scriptures and despite being blessed, people are not grateful and hence not obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Verses 11 to 25, for the second time in Quran, after we've gone through the whole story in Surah Baqarah, for the second time in Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to narrate the events of creation of Hazrat Adam alayhi salam. And the purpose of narration here will be as an example of the main message of the surah, that Allah will make us clear to it with this narration that Adam alayhi salam, when he obeyed and he stayed obedient to Allah, was successful here and will be successful hereafter also. And shaitan who disobeyed Allah and transgressed from the orders of Allah was what? Was not successful. And we have certainly created you, O mankind, and given you human form. Then we said to angels, prostrate to Adam alayhi salam. So they prostrated, except for Iblis. He was not of those who prostrated. 
So after creation, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of a creation of Adam alayhi salam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered all the angels to prostrate. And this was to prove that Adam alayhi salam was a superior being of the universe. And all of them prostrated except Iblis, as we learned in uh, Surah Baqarah also. He was what? Lam akum mina sajideen. He was not among those who prostrated. And uh, we've uh, gone through the reason in Surah Baqarah. That the reason was, Aba was takbara wa kana min al kafirin. He did not prostrate out of sheer and simple disobedience to the orders of Allah and out of stubborn arrogance to the orders of Allah. So when he did not prostrate and he did not obey Allah, what happened? Did he get away with it? Was his act ignored? What happened was, Allah narrates in verse number 12, Allah said, what prevented you from prostrating when I commanded you? Shaitan said, I'm better than him. You created me from fire and created him from clay. He was asked, Ma mana'aka. Remember, he was asked. He did not, his behavior of refusing to obey Allah and failure to, uh, to prostrate, it did not go unnoticed. He was asked, he was questioned. The message is the importance of prostration, the importance of salah, and the importance of obedience to Allah. Those who will disobey will be, they will be accounted, they will be questioned. Allahumma hasibna hisabi yasira. Those who will omit salah and those who will fail to prostrate will be questioned on the day of judgment. This confirms the words of Prophet وسلم, as have been reported in a tradition that Prophet وسلم, said that the first question on the day of judgment regarding the rights of Allah will be about salah and whose salah will be according to the sunnah of Prophet Sallallahu then all his later account will be easy, inshallah. Allahumma ja'alna minhum, rabbi ja'alni maqima salati wa min zuriyati. All his accounts will be easy. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say that if there is any shortfall in his obligatory salah, then look into his supererogatory salah and complete the deficits. And you know what happened when interrogation was done? How did Shaitan respond? Shaitan, in full obstinacy and pride and arrogance, he came out with the answer, and he also gave the reason for being better than Hazrat Adam alayhi salam. He said, he himself gave the reason of his disobedience in arrogance. Shaitan thought that he was one up. He looked down upon Adam alayhi salam. And he was, he was superior to Adam alayhi salam. He thought because his origin was better than the origin of Hazrat Adam alayhi salam. He thought that fire had power and the flames would rise high. But clay... In his, in his, according to his assumption, it did not have any power. And when left, it fell to the ground. But you know, actually, this was wrong. This was wrong because if you come to think of it, fire is destructive and it, it burns to ashes and it destroys. And as compared to that, clay is totally constructive and productive and positive. So his Arrogance was what? It was pointless and it was baseless. Remember, all those who are arrogant are doing so on pointless, baseless things which they imagine for themselves, but have no truth whatsoever. So the lesson we learned is arrogance is a triggering factor for disobedience. Shaitan did what? Abba was takbara. Arrogance is a triggering factor for disobedience and arrogance is a manner of shaitan and is high, highly disliked by Allah Almighty. Because as we learn from a tradition, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has been announced as what? He says that greatness and pride is my cloak and whoever snatches or tries to share it with me, I shall take revenge from him. So we also know and we realize that the first words of the proclamation of Salah is what? Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. 
And that is why Prophet ﷺ has informed all of us that whoever has arrogance, even equal to the seed of a mustard in his heart, shall not enter Jannah. And this is exactly what happened to Shaitan. And what was the arrogance of Shaitan is that when the companions asked Prophet Sallallahu that we all desired that the dress we wear should be nice and the, the lash which we, which we hold in our hands, it should be nice. That is this arrogance, the desiring for all these good things, is, it, is this arrogance? Prophet Sallallahu said that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, he likes beauty, he appreciates it. This is not arrogance, but arrogance is what he announced. Bathar al-Haq nas. Bathar al-Haq means what? To refuse the true orders and commandments of Allah. And we know that all the commandments of Allah are based on truth. And second is nas to look down upon the creations and the beings around us. So this is exactly how shaitan was arrogant that he disobeyed the order of prostration by Allah and he did what he looked down upon shaitan so because of these two where did he stay where did he stay he was turned out of jannah so lesson to learn is that to enter to jannah we need to be obedient to Allah we need to offer a salah and mindful of sana and we need to stay humble and from here, we all need to relate and understand that salah is the key to paradise. Leaving one sajda, leaving one prostration, and that even to Adam alayhi salam, exiled, exiled shaitan from the jannah. What will be the result of all those who do not offer, who do not offer, and who are not mindful of their salah? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, help all of us establish salah, help us and guide us and help and guide our descendants to establish salah, help our male members to establish congregational salah. May there be no, may there be none in our children who fail to establish salah. And what happened when shaitan was proud and when shaitan was arrogant and disobedient, he was thrown out of Jannah. And he was thrown out of Jannah like what? It confirms what Prophet ﷺ has informed all of us, that all the arrogant people, they will be raised as tiny ants on the day of judgment. And they will be gathered and then they will be forced towards Wallace. Companions asked what Wallace was, and he said that it is a pit of hell fire. It is what? It is a low lying valley in the hell where all the perspiration and the blood and the fluid from the wounds of the inmates of the hell will trickle. And then these arrogant people, they will be served with this that is, Tinatul Khibal. So we need to remember what? The importance of obedience, the importance of salah, and the importance of staying humble once men of Allah. Allah said, descend from paradise, for it is not for you to be arrogant therein. So get out. Indeed, you are of the debased. Verse 14, shaitan said, reprieve me, reprieve me until the day they are resurrected. This shows what? The words of Shaitan show that he knew, Shaitan very well knew and accepted and realized the authorities and control of Allah. And that is why he asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant him a waiting in period. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, indeed you are of those reprieved. Shaitan said, because you have put me in error, I will surely sit and wait for them in your straight path. So when Allah, as shown in verse number 15, Allah granted Shaitan the time. So we need, we, we learn from here that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is merciful and kind and does not only accept the requests and the supplications of the believers or the obedience only, but since he is Rahman, he also listens to and, and accepts to the supplications of the non-believers and the disobedience also because he is what? 
Ar-Rahman and Ar-Rahim. And from the verse number 16, we learn the, the reason which shaitan came up for his behavior. He said, Bima Aghwaitani. So this teaches us another satanic behavior and a response of shaitan. He, he put out he put out the plan of his misconduct. He put out the reason of his misconduct, na'uzubillah, on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said that it was only because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had created Adam alayhi salam and then ordered him to prostrate to Adam alayhi salam that shaitan defaulted. And if Allah had not done all this, he would not have disobeyed or defaulted the orders of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this behavior of disobedience, this behavior of disobedience of Shaitan was what? It was totally out of his own sheer will. Refusing to obey was out of his own sheer obstinacy. But instead of accepting and instead of confessing his faults and his follies, he was justifying and he was covering it up and putting the blame on others and insisted on carrying on with the sin and folly of arrogance also. So all this is what is a behavior of shaitan. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make all of us one of those who stay humble, who are obedient and who frequently confess, repent and seek forgiveness. Allahumma ja'alni min al-tawwabina wa ja'alni min al mutatwahirin Make us one of those who, whose tomorrow is better than today. Rabbi ghfir warham wa anta khayru rahimin. And then what did shaitan say? Shaitan said, la aqa'adunna. The sentence when we analyze it grammatically shows determination. And it highlights what? It highlights how adamant and how focused and how determined shaitan was to misguide all the children of Adam salam from the straight path, the sarat mustaqim of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What we need to realize and ask ourselves is that are we so determined and focused to save ourselves and our children from the attacks of shaitan? And do we fight shaitan with such a willpower and such a determination? And then in the next verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is explaining that how shaitan said that where and how will he attack the children of Hazrat Adam alayhi salam and make them go astray from Surat al-Mustaqim. Verse number 17, in the dialogue, shaitan said, then I will come to them from before them and from behind them and on their right and on their left, and you will not find most of them grateful to you. So the verse explains how shaitan told that he will attack the children of Adam alayhi salam to misguide them and to make them lose the sarat al mustaqim Shaitan said that he will attack them from the front, from before them. So how does Shaitan attack from the front? We know that anything that is in, in the front is visible. And being visible is thus known and is very well recognized. So it means that Shaitan will make some people commit sins knowingly realizing that what they are doing is wrong and prohibited, but still knowingly they will indulge in disobedience, in transgression, and knowingly, very, very well knowingly, will they commit sinful activity. So this will be attack of shaitan from the front. Now shaitan next said that he will attack the bondsmen of Allah from behind. It means what? It means that something which is behind us is invisible and it is not known and it cannot be related and recognized. It means the shaitan will make people commit disobedient, not willfully commit sins without realizing. And thus will shaitan will do what? Will trap the people in a sugar-coated way that not willfully knowing and realizing without realizing they will be committing deeds which will be sinful for them. 
And then Shaitan said that I will attack them from the right. So on the right is what? On the right is the Kiram and Katabin recording our righteous deeds. So it means that Shaitan will trick some people by magnifying the good deeds and the virtuous deeds. For example, like Shaitan suggesting people, like telling people that you have been so obedient and God-fearing You've turned so obedient and you've turned so God-fearing that you've started offering three salahs in a day. Look around. You'll, you'll find your friends and your cousins, they don't even offer one salah in a day. Then Shaitan might come up suggesting that you've started reading and understanding Quran now. There are people around you who don't even recite Quran. You have even started covering your head. And you find people around you, your friends and cousins around you, who go about with their hair loose, not even with headdresses also. So what Shaitan does is pumps up and boosts a person regarding his good and righteous deeds to stop, to stop and to suggest that whatever you are doing is sufficient and you need not go on doing and indulging in more righteous deeds. So to stop all good deeds for future suggesting that what you are doing is enough. Now Shaitan said that I will also attack from the left. This means what? Since the sinful acts, they are recorded on the left hands by the Karam and Katabin. It means what? That Shaitan will start minimizing a person's disobedience or the transgressions or the sins in his own sight. Like Shaitan coming up and suggesting, what if you see movies and dramas or listen to the music, everyone around you does so? What are all of them going to do on the day of judgment? After hurting someone or making or mocking someone in a loose talk, Shaitan comes up and tells you, you weren't serious, you know that. You, you really didn't want or intend to hurt the person. And this is Shaitan. Innahu lakum mubin. So he planned to attack. And he planned to attack. And he also announced that he will attack from all around, from the right, from the left, from the front and the back. But he was foolish enough to forget two roots, the root lower and the root upper. So the bondsmen have the lower root to bow down, to prostrate, and seek forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to please him. And we can raise our hands and supplicate for Allah's mercy and protection from shaitan. And then yet another attack of shaitan, what he has mentioned in the last part of the verse, Wala tajida akfarahum shakirin. Allah, you will not find most of them grateful to you. So lack of gratitude. Being ungrateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for all the blessings and bounties will also be what? It will be a attack of shaitan. Rabbi a'ini ala zikrika wa shukrika wa husni ibadatik. Allahumma ja'alni sabura wa ja'alni shakura wa ja'alni fi a'ini saghira wa fi a'yunin nasi kabira. A'uzu billahi min ash-shaytani wajim. Verse number 18, when this dialogue was took, taking place and Shaitan was explaining the different directions in which he will attack, Allah said, get out of paradise, reproached and expelled. Whoever follows you among them, I will surely fill hell with you all together. So because of the behaviors, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, turned Shaitan out of Jannah and gave the tiding of hellfire for all those who will follow him. Allahumma la taj'alna minhum rabbi a'uzu bika min hamazati shayateen wa a'uzu bika rabbi an yahdharuni. And then in the verse 19, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala indicates and narrates the next part of the event. And O Adam alayhi salam, dwell you and your wife in the paradise and eat from wherever you will, but do not approach this tree lest you be among the wrongdoers. Now this tree indicates what? Which tree it was 
uh, neither has Allah explained the name of the tree in Quran, nor does Hadith relate anything of the sort to us. The tree actually indicated what? It was a don't from Allah. The prostration was what? It was a do and shaitan did not obey and so was turned out of Jannah. The tree was a don't of Allah and Hazrat Adam salam, failed to obey and was turned out of Jannah. The lesson is what? Failure to obey the do's and don'ts of Allah will lead to, will lead to failure in the life hereafter and failure to enter Jannah. But Shaitan whispered to them to make apparent to them that which was concealed from them of their private parts. He said, your Lord did not forbid you this tree except that you become angels or become of the immortals. And he swore by Allah to them, indeed, I am, I am to you from among the sincere advisors. Verse 22, so he made them fall through deception. And when they tasted of the tree, their private parts became apparent to them and they began to fasten together over themselves from the leaves of paradise and the Lord and their Lord called to them, did I not forbid you from that tree and tell you the shaitan to you is a clear enemy? So we have, uh, we've discussed all the, these parts of the stories in Surah Baqarah. But what happened here is that when Shaitan got them into deception and they tasted the tree, the private parts became apparent. And when the private parts became apparent, what did they do? They started covering themselves up with the leaves of Jannah. This means what? This means to cover up the body and to be modest is a natural instinct. Modesty is a natural instinct for all the human beings and the bondsmen of Allah. Vulgarity will only be adopted. A person will turn vulgar only and only by suppressing, by suppressing these natural instincts of modesty and haya. And one thing which I would want to stop and highlight here is that the first attack of shaitan on the bondsmen is taking off their dresses. Taking off their dresses and hence revealing and exposing the body as a vulgar form. Because whenever shaitan plans to attack a person, a family or a society, he first of all tricks them. He first of all tricks them and deceives them and gets them into the deceptions and tries to take off a part of their dresses. And when a part of their dresses is lost, the people or the society, they lose their modesty. And once they lose their modesty, what happens is what has been reported in traditions of Prophet ﷺ that he said, that when a person loses his modesty and haya, then he may indulge in whatever he wills to. So modesty, as has been reported by Prophet ﷺ, that he said that modesty brings forth higher only. And it has been stated by Prophet ﷺ that undoubtedly every religion has a khuluk and the khuluk of Islam is modesty. Similarly, Prophet ﷺ said, Undoubtedly, modesty and faith are connected. So one, so when one gets away, the other one is also taken away. And then Prophet ﷺ has been reported to tell us also, as the, the companions report about Prophet ﷺ that he was more modest and he was more modest than an unmarried purda observing girl. And it was, it was not only him, even his companions were modest and they were mindful of their haya. As we learn from an event in the life of Prophet ﷺ, Hazrat Umme Khulad, and her, her son, and by some traditions, we also learn that her brother, they were martyred in a battle and she reached the coat of Prophet ﷺ and she was wearing a veil 
to get order information about her son and her brother. And the companions were surprised. And they said that you are, you are observing your purda and you are in a state of veil even at this difficult time and in this state of crisis. She replied as a message for all of us. She said, she said that I have definitely lost my son and my brother, but I have not lost my modesty. So losing modesty is like opening the doors to all forms of major sins. Prophet Sallallahu has been reported to inform all of us that modesty only brings goodness. And modesty only brings goodness. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala help us, guide us all to remain modest, to remain humble and obedient and protect our haya and modesty. So now if I relate to it, tracing back how events in the societies change slowly and steadily. If I trace back what happened like a few decades earlier, we will all notice that we know that our mothers and our grandmothers, they used to very conveniently and very easily, they used to cover their heads by their headdresses. But slowly and steadily, and I remember in my childhood, in my school time, Shaitan somehow tricked and managed to get the headdresses off. And then Shaitan focused and tried to narrow down the headdresses to a string hanging on the shoulders, totally exposing the chest, despite the orders, clear cut orders of Quran, much opposing Allah's orders, as Allah says, well, that, oh, Muslim women, what you need to do is that your headdresses, you need to put them to cover them up, to cover your chest and to cover up your breasts because these are itself your adornments. And then after achieving all this, Shaitan started working up at the sleeves. The sleeves used to be full sleeves. Very convenient did, did I, I, I do remember in my school time, all the girls used to wear and they were all used to wearing full sleeves but slowly and steadily they came up to three-fourth sleeves and then to half sleeves and then to cape sleeves finally ending up with sleevelesses now shaitan finally revealing the hair and the heads and the chest and the arms then started attending to the legs slit pants capris tights all planning to make the muslim woman reveal their legs like the European women. And remember, he will, he will achieve his targets until and unless we work to stop, we work to put a stop to all this vulgar tactics of shaitan. A'uzu billahi minash shaitan rajim Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us maintain our modesty, protect the iman and modesty of ourselves and our daughters and granddaughters also. Verse number 23. <coughs> when the dresses were taken off and they were trying to conceal and cover their bodies with the, with the leaves from Jannah, they said, Rabbana, Zolamna, Anfusana, wa illam tarfir lana, wa tarhamna, lanakunanna min al khasirin. This was what? This verse tells us the supplication of Hazrat Adam salam, when he realized that he had disobeyed and then he accepted, he regretted and he, uh, he asked for a supplication. He, he recited the words of these supplications seeking forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and repenting on his, on his sin and on his disobedience. Allah said, descend, being to another, being to another, one another enemies, and for you on the earth is a place of settlement and enjoyment for a time. He said, therein you will live, and therein you will die, and from it you will be brought forth. Verse number 26, O children of Adam salam, we have bestowed upon you clothing to conceal your private parts and as an adornment but the clothing of righteousness that is the best that is from the signs of Allah that perhaps they will remember 
So now, in this verse, after narrating the events of the creation of Adam alayhi salam and the dialogue between shaitan and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah is here now in this verse mentioning the purpose of dress for the children of Adam alayhi salam. Allah says the first purpose of dress is that you are thawatikum, and the second purpose is Risha. Before this, Allah has said that we have bestowed upon you clothing, sent down dress upon you. Qad anzalna alaykum libasan means that Allah is saying that we have sent down dress upon you. Sending down of dress means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent down the orders of the dress code for the Muslims and for the obedience. And the second thing it refers to is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down the resources for our worldly dresses, like the flowers of the cotton plant, the silk worm making the silk thread and the wool and the leather from the animals. And then the plant dies and the pigments for dyeing fabrics with which we are going to make our dresses. So the first thing is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, uh, has given us or sent down dresses for us. And the purpose of making dress was, is mentioned as you are sawatikum warisha. So here, two main purposes of giving the human beings dress are being explained. The first the first purpose of blessing us with dress is that it should co cover the satar. So, uh, the dress should be like for a Muslim that it should cover the satar. Satar is what? Satar, as we learn from Quran and Hadith, is the part of the bodies which have to be concealed, which have to be hidden and the parts of the bodies which we do not and we should not reveal. So it means the bare minimum, it explains to us the satr, knowing and understanding the satr, we would be able to understand the bare minimum part of the body which is permissible to be revealed. Remember, the satr is different for women and for men. For men, the satr is from the navel to the knees. And it means that this is the minimum part of the body the Muslim men need to conceal and they will not be revealing these minimum parts of the body. This by no means does it refer that they should go about in just such brief outfits, but means what? That while any physical labor or any other day to day work commitments, they in all any other situations, this is what has to be covered in any case, and the rest might be revealed if needed in certain situations. Now for the Muslim women, the minimum part which has to be covered by Muslim women in front of women folk themselves is from the navel to the knees. And uh, for because, you know, we might be working, we might be cleaning or washing or even lactating our children. So it is permissible. But again, I would want to repeat that this by no means does it refer that women should go about in all these brief outfits in front of the uh, other Muslim women. But it means what? That for conditions where it, it becomes difficult to conceal these parts of the bodies, then it is permissible other than only the satar of the body. Now for Muslim women, now regarding the men for Muslim women, we have two circles. The first circle is the seven mehram male relations, which we've already learned about previous verses of Quran, that these seven mehram male relatives, the Muslim women need to cover their head and their body, except their face and hands and feet until their, till their ankles. But in front of the non mehram strangers, she, the Muslim woman, is also supposed to cover her face. And uh, that itself is her satr in front of the non mehram uh, males. Her face is also the part of satr, and she is not supposed to reveal that in front of the non mehram uh, males 
as have been explained, the list has been explained in Quran. So we learn that the first purpose of making a dress by a Muslim should be that it should be concealing and should be non-revealing. So what we need to remember is that may we be making a dress for ourselves, our daughters, daughter-in-laws, granddaughters, sisters, friends, or even sometimes our clients. The primary priority should be that it should cover the part which is not permitted to be revealed. The dress, the first and the primary, primary priority while preparing a dress should be that it should be satir and should be concealing of the satir and should not be revealing. The second person, uh, the second uh, purpose of the dress has been explained as risha. Risha in Arabic means the feathers of a bird. Now, what role do the feathers play for the birds is that the feathers give the bird comfort from hot and from cold and from rain and from winds and protects the body. It is a source of entity and recognition for the bird and is also uh, as a source of beauty and adds to the beauty of the birds itself. So, the question, uh, so what the Quran is trying to explain here is that the dress like the reach of birds, we can in fact, and in fact, we not only can, in fact, we should wear dress with all these purposes of um, keeping us comfortable and protecting our bodies from the, from the heat of summers and the cold of winters and from the rain and winds. And it should be a source of our entity and recognition and also should be adding to our beauty also. This is all permissible in Quran, according to the teachings of Quran, but at the same time, we need to not keep on showing and exhibiting and demonstrating our dresses to beyond the limits of Quran and beyond the limits set by the teachings of Quran. And then here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the last part of the verse is adding, taqwa zalika hair. Allah says, and Allah comments that otherwise the best dress for the Muslims is a dress of piety, a dress of righteousness. What is the dress of piety? It means a dress which is worn, which is worn with or which is used with the fear of Allah with the fear of anger, with the fear of wrath and the punishments of Allah, with the fear to disobey and to displease Allah, with the fear of the dresses of hellfire, the dresses regarding which the Quran says that they have already been tailored for the inmates of hell. So all the dress code which is adopted, keeping this fear in the frame of mind, the dress will be the dress of taqwa, the clothing of righteous people. Now here, I would want to relate and explain certain prerequisites we would we need to learn for the dress to be the dress of piety or the dress of the righteous and the God-fearing Muslims. So I will be uh, pointing out the prerequisites and the characteristics of the dress. And then I will be proving them logically, giving references from Quran and Hadith. So the first thing is that the dress of piety should be what? You are so atikum, as we've just gone through in this verse 26. So it should cover the first prerequisite of the dress of piety is that it should cover the body properly. It should, it should conceal the satar and it should be non-revealing. The second thing is that it should not be too tight. It should not be too tight and fitted to the extent that it will be, despite being covered, the parts of the body and the figure and the curvatures of the figure will be revealed despite being dressed. And the third thing is that it should not be transparent. It should not be transparent to reveal the body underlying. <coughs> Prophet وسلم, has been reported in a tradition that he said that women who are clothed yet, yet naked, women who are clothed yet they are naked, 
walking with an enticing gait, attracting people towards them. They will not enter paradise, nor even will they smell its fragrance, although its fragrance may be detected from such a such distance. So being clothed and naked means what? That they should not be overfitted and tied to reveal the figure of the body and they may not be light clothing that will not be covering what is beneath the cloth itself of the body so this is meaning that they should be not clothed and yet naked prophet sallallahu he once he had two pieces of cloth and they were both uh, just light and they were transparent. He gave it to one of his companions and asked him to make a shirt out of one of them and give the other to his wife, but ask her and guide her to use another cloth underneath. <coughs> so it means what? That we can wear transparent or light fabrics, but with a lining underneath to make it non-transparent and non-revealing. Then the fourth uh, quality of a dress of piety should be that the dress should not be as if to copy the dress code of the non-Muslims because it has been reported in a tradition that Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, whoever copies, whoever copies and follows the non-Muslims is one of them. Then the fifth thing is that the dress of women should not resemble the, or the, the dress of the men and the dress of the men should not remem, uh, resemble the dress code and the mannerism of dressing of women folk, of the Muslim, Muslim women. Because Prophet Sallallahu has been reported to inform all of us that four people, four people on the day of judgment towards whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not even look at them, will not even converse with them, and will not also purify them. And we know that when in Quran or Hadith, where all these punishments are being mentioned, this is what? A major sin. So four people are the men who copy the mannerism of females, the female who copy the mannerisms and the dresses of the males, a person who indulges in homosexuality and a person who indulges in sodomy. So this is that the dresses of Muslim women and Muslim men be intrinsically different and maintain their own separate entities. The other manner of the dress of piety or the dress of the righteous is that the dress should not be of extravagance as we will be going through the verse very soon inshallah that Allah says that you may be eating you may drink but do not be wasteful and do not be extravagant why because Allah does not love all those who are wasteful and extravagant so the dresses should not be extravagant and the dress should not be for the desire of arrogance to show off for this for exhibition and for demonstration or riya because Prophet has told all of us that anyone who wears a dress for fame that is the purpose of dressing up or wearing a dress was that he becomes very popular and famous and becomes known because of his dress or his dress itself gets to be known that she is very refined and she is very polished and her dress always turns up to be the best. So Prophet Sallallahu said, anyone who wears a dress for fame will be clad in a dress of shame on the day, on the day of judgment. And a person who prefers to wear simple dress, Prophet Sallallahu has promised that if a person despite economic affordability, that is the person can very well afford to wear an expensive dress or an extravagant dress. If a person describe, despite the economic affordability wears or chooses to wear a simple dress, then on the day of judgment, he will be given the choice to choose between the robes from the robes of Jannah. Allah will ask him to choose two robes from the robes of Jannah. Allahumma ja'alna minhum. 
O children of Adam salam, let not shaitan tempt you as he removed your parents from paradise, stripping them of their clothings to show them their private paths. Indeed, he sees you, he and his tribe, from where you do not see them. Indeed, we have made the devil's allies to those who do not believe. Verse 28, and when they commit an immorality, they say, we found our fathers doing it, and Allah has ordered us to do it. Say, indeed, Allah does not order immorality. Do you say about Allah that which you do not know? Say, my Lord has ordered justice, and that you maintain yourselves in worship of him at every place or time of prostration and invoke him sincere to him in religion just as he originated you you will return to life so in these verses especially the verse 28 allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning a behavior of the people of mecca they used to perform their tawaf the tawaf of haram without their clothes all naked and you know what after doing such an immoral uh, behavior and adopting such a manner they used to justify themselves by saying that this was the norm this was a norm in the arab society and even their ancestors used to do the same you know what happened actually was that it, it was shaitan who had misguided them to start adopting this manner. Shaitan had misguided them, telling them that when you dress up and you wear your daily and you carry on your normal daily activities, then your clothes, they get filthy with, with dust and with, with perspiration. So before entering the harem, take off these dirty and filthy clothes and so that you can enter the haram and worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala all clean and neat and pure. And so they were trapped in the trick of shaitan. How foolish, how foolish of these people to be trapped in the trick of shaitan and how clever of shaitan to trap them up like this. You know, in fact, Shaitan could have also suggested that, look, your clothes are not clean, they are filthy, they are impure, and they are dirty. So when, look, when you enter into the haram, change these clothes with clean and neat clothes and purify your clothes and your bodies as well. But Shaitan has never suggested something which leads to purity, which needs to obedience, and which needs to following the commandments of Allah. But Shaitan tricks and very cleverly guides or misguides people towards the disobedience and towards a state of uh, immorality and uh, losing the modesty itself. A group of you he guided and a group deserved to be in error. Indeed, they had taken the devils as allies instead of Allah while they thought that they were guided. A'uzu billahi minash shaitwani rajeem. O children of Adam alayhi salam, take your adornments at every mosque and eat and drink, but be not excessive. Indeed, he likes not those who commit excess. Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this verse is permitting all of us to take our adornments while we offer our salah and while we pay a visit to the mosque for congregational salah. And this is exactly what has been taught to us when we purify ourselves, when we are doing wudu before salah, we clean our exposed parts of the body. And these only are the exposed parts of the body when, our, when during our normal day-to-day -day life activities, they get dirty and they get filthy and they get messed up. So during wudu, we clean all these parts of the body and then we are uh, we have been taught to wear clean and neat and pure clothes when we go to the mosque so this is because a person who is going to the mosque is actually a person who is introducing islam a person who is introducing uh, uh, the obedience of allah to all those people around them so they need to maintain their modesty and they need to 
carry themselves in a very respectable and an honorable manner also because all the Muslims going for congregational salah are what? They are announcers and introducers of this beautiful religion and this beautiful book. And here in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ordering us, there is a don't of Quran, wala tusrif. Do not do not be wasteful and do not indulge in extravagance and excess. I shall be talking about Israf and Tabzir in, uh, in the sum of the next uh, surahs of the Quran, inshallah. Say, who has forbidden the adornments of Allah, which he has produced for his servants and the good lawful things of provisions? Say, they are for those who believe during the worldly life, but exclusively for them on the day of resurrection. Thus, do we detail the verses for people who know? Say, my Lord has only forbidden immoralities, what is apparent of them and what is concealed and sin and oppression without right and that you associate with Allah for which he has not sent down authority and that you say about Allah that which you do not know and for every nation is a specified term so when their time has come they will not remain behind an hour nor will they precede it O children of Adam alayhi salam, if there come to you my messengers from among you relating to you my verses, then whoever fears Allah and reforms, there will be no fear concerning them, nor will they grieve. Remember, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not going to gather two states of fear. Those who stay fearful of Allah in, their, in this life, in this worldly life, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will call out on the day of judgment for those who feared Allah in their lives there will be no fear for them hereafter and those who were fearless in this life they will be they will be subjected to all forms of fears and tensions and anxieties by the torments of the day of judgment and the day uh, and the hellfire in all forms allahumma aati nafsi taqwaha but the ones who deny our verses are the arrogant and are arrogant towards them those are the companions of fire and they will abide therein eternally allah subhanahu wa ta'ala la taj'alna minhum Allahumma aati nafsi taqwaha, Allahumma ja'alni saburan wa ja'alni shakura. Verse number 37. From here onwards till the verse 51, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will narrate a dialogue, will narrate a dialogue between the inmates of Jannah, the hell, and Araf, and will also be showing us a scene and the whole narration would be as if we are going through a video of the whole happening on the day of judgment. And this will be, this video will be like played in front of us. And this dialogue will be narrated to all of us with the purpose that we, that it lets us all think, how do we want to spend our lives to reach which destination which is being shown to us of the days of, of the life hereafter. For us to pick and choose that where would we want to end up with the Jannah, the Hellfire, or Araf is why this is being shown and narrated to all of us. In this verse number 37, so Allah says, and who is more unjust than the one who invents about Allah a lie and he denies his verses? Those will attain, or those will attain their portion of the decree until when our messengers come to them to take them in death. Who these messengers are being mentioned are the angels of death. Our messengers come to them to take them in death. They will say. So here is a dialogue between the angel of the death and a person who was a disbeliever and was a disobedient person or a polytheist, what happens as a dialogue at the time of death. These death angels will say, where are those you used to invoke besides Allah? 
and the person to whom the death is being uh, attended and who is being asked at this place will say, they will say, they have departed from us and will bear witness against themselves that they were disbelievers. So once this will happen at the time of the death of the disobedience and the polytheists, then what will happen next? Allah will say, enter among nations which had passed on before you of jinn and mankind into the fire. Every time a nation enters, it will curse its sister until when they will have all overtaken one another therein. So there will be all, all the disobedience, the polytheists, the transgressors, and the arrogant disobedient, they will be made to enter the fire. And what will happen when they will be made to enter the fire? That they will curse each other. They will curse each other. The people who would be coming later on and who will enter the hell later on, they will, they will curse the people who would be there already. Why would there be a mutual cursing between the inmates, inmates of hell? Because, you know, the inmates will be congested and they will be all packed up in that tight hell pit. Now, when the next group will be forced to enter, they will curse each other because of less space and because of the congestion. And what the people who will be coming later, what will they do next? The last of them will say about the first of them, oh Lord, oh Lord, these, these people, they had misled us. So give them a double punishment of fire. And what will Allah say? He will say, for each is a double, but you do not know. The later group will demand double punishment for the predecessors. Why? Assuming that they had been misguided on the wrong path because of them. And so they needed double punishment because of their own wrongdoings and because of the misguided wrongdoings the, their, pre, pre, uh, their uh, successors had done. So the answer will be that for everyone is double because, because it will be only fair. And it will be said that because if you were misguided by your predecessors, then you know that you misguided your successors also. Hence, you will also be deserving of double punishment. And the first of them will say to the last of them, then you had not any favor over us. So taste the punishment for what you used to earn. Verse number 40, indeed, those who deny our verses and are arrogant towards them, the gates of heaven will not be opened for them, nor will they enter the paradise until a camel enters into the eye of a needle, and thus do we recompense the criminals. So in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is explaining that it will be as next to impossible for the disobedient people and for the arrogant disobedient, it will be as next to impossible for them to enter the Jannah as it is next to impossible that the camel may enter the eye of a needle. They will have from hell a bed, Allahumma ajirna minan nar, and over them coverings of fire. Rabba nasrif anna azaba juhannum, inna azabaha qana gharama, inna ha saad mustaqarrum wa maqama. And thus we do recompense the wrongdoers. <coughs> but those who believed, and did righteous deeds. We charge no soul except within its capacity. Those are the companions of Jannah. They will abide therein eternally. Allahumma ja'alna minhum. Verse 43. And we will have removed whatever is within their breasts of resentment while flowing beneath them are rivers. And they will say, Alhamdulillah, who has guided us to this? And we will never have been guided if Allah had not guided us. Certainly the messengers of our Lord had come with the truth and they will be called this is paradise which you have been made to inherit for what you believed no what will be the announcement which you have been made to inherit for what you used to do so it is acquiring Jannah basically because of the righteous deeds which are going to accompany the belief and the faith of a Muslim bondsman 
So now talking about the, the inmates, the obedient inmates of Jannah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning here that all forms of mutual resentments and harsh feelings, mutual harsh feelings will be taken out of their souls and their breasts. And they will be, this will be like totally contrary to the people of hellfire. And in Jannah, there will be no cursing, there will be no fighting, and there will be no mutual enmity between the inmates of Jannah. Like as Allah says in Quran, La yasma'una fiha laqwam wa la ta'seema illa qeelan salaman salama. And then the inmates of uh, the Jannah, they will say what? Alhamdulillah, praise to Allah. Why will they say that? Because these were the people who in their normal day-to-day -day lives, during their worldly lives, they were, they were used to remembering Allah and exalting Allah and praising Allah and being grateful to Allah. So according to their previous manners, they will still exalt and praise and be grateful to Allah. And moreover, after, after such a long journey, after the death and after the grave and the day of judgment and the bridge of Sarat will finally, when they reach the Jannah, like any traveler reaching their desired destination, they will say, Alhamdulillah. And then when they will, they will have in their sight the Jannah, the Jannah which no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no heart can in the wildest dreams comprehend when they will see the bounties and the blessings of Jannah, then they will say, Alhamdulillah, like in their worldly life when they used to receive and they used to see the beautiful creations of Allah, they used to say, Alhamdulillah. So now they will say, Alhamdulillah. And moreover, Moreover, Prophet Sallallahu has also informed all of us in a tradition that praising and exalting Allah and glorifying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be what? It will be made instinctive for the inmates of hell, similar like breathing has been made instinctive for people in this worldly life. Rabbi Aini ala zikrika wa shukrika wa husni ibadatik. Verse 44, and the companions of paradise will call out to the companions of fire. We have already found out what our Lord promised us to be true. So these people of Jannah, they will announce and they will declare that they have found all the robes and the jewelries and the palaces, the gardens, the springs, the fountains, which had been promised in Quran, in Jannah. They found out all to be true and they've received all the bounties in Jannah. And they will ask, have you found what, have you found what your Lord promised to be true also? And they will say yes. The people of the Jannah will ask the people of hell that have you found all those clothes of fire, the dresses of fire, the sheets, the beddings and the carpets of fire, the foods, the food of the thorny bushes and the drinks of Ghassak and the mine, Hamima. Have you all found there in hellfire? And they will confirm, they will say yes. Allahumma ajirna min al -nar. And then an announcer will announce among them, the curse of Allah shall be upon the wrongdoers. Which wrongdoers who averted people from the way of Allah and sought to make it seem deviant while they were concerning the hereafter, while they were concerning the hereafter disbelievers. And verse 46, and between them will be a partition. And on its elevations are men who recognized all by their marks. And they call out to the companions of paradise, peace be upon you. They have not yet entered it, but they long intensely. So who longs intensely? Here is being mentioned now, the people on the Araf, the people on the elevation. Allah is mentioning about the station of Araf and the people of Araf. Eraf is what? It will be a partition between the hellfire and between a Jannah. And on top of the Eraf, the people of Eraf will be all those 
whose good and evil deeds, when they will be weighed on the scales of Jannah, will turn out to be equal. So their, so their decision of entering Jannah or their decision of being thrown into hellfire will be postponed. Their good deeds and their bad deeds will weigh equal, so their decision will be postponed. And in the postponed period, they will be made to stay on the Araf as a waiting period. And what will happen in the end is that this waiting period on the Araf, it will be, it will be very stressful. And this stressful waiting period would itself be a punishment. And this will turn out as an atonement for the evil deeds. And so finally, as a recompense, they will finally, after this stressful waiting period on the Araf, they will finally enter Jannah. We learn what? We need to be extremely, extremely sensitive and very, very mindful of never ever delaying or stopping from a righteous deed, however small or insignificant it might be seeming to us because you know this one small one small pious righteous deed might just trip the scale for the decision of jannah and never ever never ever should we dare to commit a sin however trivial it might seem it might just trip the scales of sins for the decision of hell fire Rabbi ibn li aindaka baytan fil jannah Allahumma ajirna min an-nar and when their eyes are turned toward the companions of hellfire whom the people of araf when they will see the inmates of hellfire they will say our lord do not place us with the wrong doing people so there is a continuous narration of the dialogue of the people of Jannah with the people of Hellfire, the people of Araf with the people of Jannah, and then with the people of Hellfire. And now what? And the companions of the elevations will call to the men within the hell, whom they will recognize by their marks. They will say, of no avail to you was your gatherings and the fact that you were arrogant allah will say are these are these the ones whom you whom you you means what the inhabitants of hell you swore in your worldly life you swore that allah will never offer them mercy enter paradise o people of elevation no fear will there be concerning you nor will you grieve and the companions of fire. Now, this is the last part of the dialogue. The companions of hellfire will call to the companions of paradise. Pour upon us, pour upon us some water or from whatever Allah has provided you. And what will the inmates of Jannah say and answer back? They will say, indeed, Allah has forbidden them for both Allah has forbidden them both, that is the food and the water and the drinks of paradise, forbidden them both to the disbelievers. Here in this verse, in this verse the inmates of hell, the inmates of hell will call out to the inmates of Jannah. When? Just imagine, they, after a waiting period of 1,000 years on the day of judgment, with the sun as close as an arrow, and they sweating. When, and finally, when they're reaching the hell fire, they will be served by zakum, the poisonous tree, the poisonous plant, which when they will consume will bubble up in their gut. And then they will ask for water. And when they will ask for water, they will be given Mine, Hameen, mine, Sadil, Wasak. Mine, Hameen will be what? The bubbling water, the boiling water, it will be offered to them. And then they will be, they will be thirsty, obviously, thirsty like anything. And then they will be in the heat, the scorching heat of the hell fire. And in all those situations and conditions, they will, be, they will be observing and they will be seeing the inmates of Jannah. They will be roaming about in the streams of clean water and honey. 
and drinks and fountains and springs and taking streamlets to their palaces. So they will see the people of Jannah being served with meats and fruits of all forms. And then they will beg, they will beg that they, they just, just give them a little, more, little amount of all the drinks they've been served with. And they will beg the inmates of Jannah to throw, to throw some food from Jannah for them. How deprived, how deprived they would be, what regret they would feel, and how humiliated they will be, dishonored they would be, asking for throwing of the food, like throwing of food to the animal. We just need to stop here. We just need to stop and think. If one of the near and dear ones would be in Jannah, and the others would be in hellfire, begging for food and for drinks from their relatives in Jannah. A son, a son begging out and calling his mother, oh mom, throw, throw them some of the water on me. A daughter crying out for his father, for the food, for the food of Jannah. A grandson howling, howling out to his grand mom in Jannah. Here in this worldly life, we don't even think of dining out all by ourselves without our near and dear ones. And there in Jannah exposed to all these situations. Remember that is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told all of us in Quran, وَقُوْ وَأَحْلِيكُمْ نَارًا just don't, just don't carry on selfishly for yourselves, trying to save just your own souls from the hellfire or trying and working and struggling to, to get to the destination of Jannah for your souls only, but work and strive and struggle for your near and dear ones also and try and work and struggle and strive to save your near and dear ones also from the hellfire. Allahumma ajirna min an-nar. Allahumma ajirna min an-nar. Rabbana asrif anna azab jahannam. Inna azabaha qana gharama. Inna hasat mustaqarrum wa maqama. Verse 51. And why will the in inmates of Jannah, they will say that Allah has forbidden the foods and the drinks of the Jannah for the disbelievers, they will give the reason, as has been explained in verse 51, that who took their religion as a distraction, an amusement, and whom the worldly life has had deluded. So today we will forget, forget them just as they forgot the meeting of this day of theirs and for having, the, for having rejected our verses. And we had certainly brought them a book which we detailed by knowledge as guidance and mercy to people who believe. Do they, do they evade, accept this result? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after narrating and after showing us all the scenes and all the pictures and all the uh, uh, narrating all the dialogues, is now asking, are you awaiting that actually all these happenings happen? And you end up in any one of these scenarios? Do you await, accept its results? Remember, the day its results come, those who had ignored it before will say, the messengers of your Lord had come with the truth. So are there now any intercessors to intercede for us? Or could we be sent back to do other than we used to do? They will have lost themselves. And lost from them is what they used to invent. Allahumma alhimna rushdan wa aizna min shururi anfusina. Rabbi jalli maqim as salati wa min zuriyati. Rabbana taqabbal dua. Rabbana gfirli wali walidayya. Walil mu'minina yawma yakumul hisab. Rabbana la tuzi' qulubana. Bada is hadaytana. Wahhab lana miladunka rahma. Innaka antal wahhab. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika, nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta, nastaghfiruka wa natubu alayk. Subhana rabbika rabbil aizzati amma yasifun, wa salamun ala al-mursaleen, walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, ameen sumameen.